on this episode of Postcards. This is basically what this project's all about. It's supposed to bring us together, like uh, not only the Micronesian, but other communities. I really feel um, I want my art accessible and I want to be accessible to people in my community. Music has given me a full life, a good life. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage-funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota, on the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 967cram.com. We come from a people that have thousands of years of traveling through these kinds of crafts and the ability to sail long distance using knowledge about the environment, stars, waves, clouds. To find Micronesian canoes in the plains of Minnesota shouldn't shock us because we have voyaging and movement in our cultural DNA. My name is Gabriel Elias and I'm one of the leaders here in uh, our Micronesian community uh, that resides in this area. I live here in town, Milan, and we built a canoe. <laughs> so I teach here at the University of Minnesota American Indian Studies. I'm from Micronesia, from the island of Guam, and with lineage to some of the other islands. I started to get to know the folks from Milan. Brought my canoe, I have an outrigger canoe that I've had with me here. And they wanted to a canoe of their own. And uh, Michael and Gabriel from the community asked me to help them do that. I'm a historian, but I also look at the survival of seafaring traditions in Micronesia. So that work has, has got me working with men from Polowat Atoll. I've been doing work with them for about 30 years. I'm originally from Polowat, one of the island in Chuk State, in the Federal State of Micronesia. And I live in Saipan with my family. I'm, I'm a navigator. I was ordained a navigator two or three years ago. Back home, that's what we use. We use canoe, we navigate, you know, like islands to get food, to go and fishing. So that's how, since, you know, like when you, I was small, I started, you know, like going with my father, with my uncles and cousins. And then I helped them carve canoe when I was, you know, like still young boy. I miss what I've been doing back home. Like when I was young, I used to go swimming on the beach. Uh, 
play with friends, go fishing with my uncles. Life is very, like uh, really free and unique. Uh, over here, it's totally different. It's a different environment, different life. With the help of uh, a couple of grants at the university, we put together the funds to bring Mario and an assistant, Laureano. We also wanted them to do work with folks in the upper and lower Sioux communities to build the Dakota dugout as well, what they call Wata. Dr. Diaz talked about a few things that he's working on and that he wanted to um, be respectful of whose land the Micronesians are on. And traditionally, that's Dakota land. Our people use canoes to, to travel, to hunt, to uh, go wild ricing, to do a lot of things, you know, and that was a part of who we are as Dakota. You're going to shape it more, Mario? Yeah, shape it more over here, make it a little bit smoother. And then... So the plan was to have a group of uh, Lower Sioux members, a group of Upper Sioux members, and the Micronesians to work with Mario and his assistant on these different canoes. <laughs> So we have a little one that was made a couple Thanksgivings ago. The dugout that Mario is helping us with. He went to the Montevideo Museum and they have a few dugout canoes there. Um, the one that we have and then other research they did to look at it um, to, to make it close enough, you know? Yeah. Tawata Gahupi. Ta tree wata boat gahupi means they're like a digging it out, they're taking out that inner membrane. Tawata Gahupi. That's that's how you would say dugout canoe or making a dugout canoe. I myself I am Lakota, we're more horse people bull riders. My children are Dakota and um, it's just really important to know who you are and where you come from and uh, you know embrace that. Outbreaker you know like there's big difference because Dakot canoe is only one one hull but the uh, the Outrigger canoe there is you know Outrigger on the other side of the canoe to make it balance and another thing is Outrigger canoe has sail. A few years back, I started to ask myself who I am and where I, what, you know, what my culture's like. A young kid came home from school. He asked me, Wait, what's our culture's like? I said, why? His teachers asked him what his culture's like, and he doesn't know. And I kind of paused for a little bit and thinking to myself, wait, I, I don't even know my cultures as well. And uh, I kind of think to myself, I'm Micronesian and I, I need to know, I need to know at least a little bit of the skills that they have. And this is one of the a very, very important things that we do back home by carving canoes. <laughs> This is basically what this project's all about. It's supposed to bring us together, like uh, not only the Micronesian, but other communities. The hope is to, to make a Viking ship one day. So it'd be the, the big Norwegian population in Milan, and then the Micronesians, and then the Dakotas, to, to have the three communities canoe together to bring um, that connection, that, that healing, that sense of belonging to, to the three communities that are represented there. Um, although Dakotas 
aren't living there at the time, but it's our traditional homeland. It's really exciting to see a traditional Micronesian canoe here, and it's also very exciting to see a traditional Dakota water here. This is an outward tangible sign of people's perseverance, you know, their, their resolve to be who they are despite challenges and assaults. And it's, it's really important that both the university and community people uh, see these and begin to participate in the process, you know. I'm glad and like I'm part of this project to help out my fellow Micronesian here in Milan. We don't want to Spanish, you know, like from the uh, earth. We want to make it alive. For me, I want, I want the culture to make it alive, to keep on going to the next generation. The name of the Aldricker in our language, we call it Wa. Wa means the vessel. The vessel that in your body, which is, you know, like carry the blood in your body. It's bringing things to the family, the whole island. So it's very, very important and sacred to us. I'm really fascinated for the way these, these guys like Mario and his clan, whole clan, they can sail afar uh, from islands to islands, like a hundred miles and be able to navigate themselves through the big water. I think that this is going to be the first steps of uh, learning how to carve a canoe and then, you know, learn how to sail. thought it's really nice to be able to know where you come from and what you do and what your culture is like. Hi, I'm Tamara Eastfeld and I work, I say, as a community artist because it's not just about making my life career as making my paintings and making my living that way. I really feel connected to my community and I'm also an art teacher and I work in the high school at YME. We live in a small community so one of my goals was to have a community that I live in that kind of the arts are thriving in so to make that happen you kind of have to be invested and give back to the community. I really love doing any type of art. I think I'm probably best known for my painting and it's like playing with colored mud. I mean, it's just, there's something about the textures of paint that is soothing and fun and it's always something exciting. I do portraits and I do a lot of landscapes. I would say that's my, my two biggest areas. I also do a lot of commission work as well. Sometimes I want it to be very, very freeform where I just take out the colors I think I want to use and then I just wipe them across the canvas and then I give that a chance to rest and then I look at it, it's like, okay, now I have to problem solve and how do I want to do this? That's one way I'll do it. Another way I'll do it is very controlled where I'll do an underpainting first where I give it a tonal color first and then after that I'll sketch out what I want it to be and then I will just painting it in and that's probably more like when I'm doing a portrait I'll do it typically a portrait that way but if I'm doing a landscape it's usually just put on the paint. So one of the community type projects that I've been working on is a mural that's downtown along the river wall and that was a grant through Smock, which is a um, legacy grant.
I didn't start teaching until I was like 40. I don't know if I would have been ready to be an art teacher when I was 25. I don't think that I was there, my mindset. I think it was after raising my own kids that I started realizing oh, you have to get better, more efficient, time management, all that kind of stuff that when I was in my 20s I probably didn't have. <laughs>when I'm creating just my own artwork, there's a sense of that wonder and creating and that process and it's very fulfilling and time just kind of flies by. But when then you can take that same and then pass that on, it's like passing on a torch. And you can see that same frustration and then, you know, so excited when they get to a point where they're really happy with something that they've created themselves. And so that's what the joy of teaching is for me, is watching somebody else get excited about creating or going just through that process of the frustration and don't know what I'm doing, getting better and all of a sudden, aha, I love what I'm doing. And that's, that's really fun. Anybody can find joy when you see them. So some people wrote words on them like breathe, relax, enjoy, things like that. Living in Granite Falls, it's a small community. At first when I moved here, I didn't know many other artists and that was kind of challenging at first, but then we kind of started the Granite Area Art Council and, and with that kind of came connections to other artists and people who really were um, passionate about art, maybe if they weren't artists themselves. And so it gave that a place for conversations to go or to see what other people were doing to kind of have that creative outlet with people that were like-minded and so it was surprised at how many people there were once I lived here for a little while. I really feel um, I want my art accessible and I want to be accessible to people in my community. So I have a lot of connections with community-based projects. So one of those projects is through the 100-year Prohibition anniversary. We have Andrew Volstead's home and he lived here in Granite Falls. And so the Historical Society had put a artist call out there to see who would be interested in doing something like that and that was definitely right away I kind of you know piqued my interest and so I applied. So I'm now making a series of six paintings that I'm doing over the summer and they're based on the different factors of prohibition like what led up to prohibition during the years of prohibition and when prohibition ended and then also a little bit on cooperatives because while well, Andrew Volstead is mainly known for his work with the Prohibition Act. His big thing to him was the cooperative movement and working with farmers and then others to kind of gain that power and control. I just wish more people felt that they could call themselves an artist, or at least if not artist, maybe a creative person. So I think sometimes they also think that if you don't do it full time as a living, that you make your soul living on your artwork, that then you can't be an artist. And I don't think that's true either. I think art is more like a way of life. It's a, it's a creative process, not necessarily just your end all to make money. I entered the Air Corps in December of 43. My goal was to uh, become a flying officer. The cadet program was oversubscribed, so they uh, made available to me to be either a gunner, a mechanic in the Air Corps, or a radio operator, and I chose radio operators. And in December of 44, uh, I was flying overseas to Burma and India. The Japanese were still occupying Burma in January of 45 when I got there. So yeah, the war lasted another uh, six, seven months after that. When I was stationed at a small airport on the Bay of Bengal called Rum Kapalong. One night then in March the 25th, 1945, a single Japanese zero came in and uh, bombed our small air base. And there was casualties. Our houseboy, we called him a 12-year-old Burmese boy, and he was killed. That's 75 years ago since I learned the Morse code, and I can still, for example, my last name, Larson, 
da 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 det da 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 det da da det det da da det and it was a, became a second language to us so this device here is we call it a bug it's a sending key many times when you see sending keys on the tv or whatever they have a up and down button this is a made for high speed so you hold it over and it the longer you hold it over the more dots you get in my case i learned to take international morse code up to 30 words a minute which is quite fast I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. After the war was over, and when I got back into the States and was discharged, I still was only 20 and a half years old, not of legal age to vote or to buy a bottle of beer. Our uncles, the Bursko brothers, had a band. They performed or they went in the 1920s and the 30s. And so, as kids, we would go with our parents to dances, and we'd hear them playing. And music just got ingrained into us at an early age. This is the horn my my dad bought for me when I was a junior in high school. It looks tough now, but it saw a lot of playing. I played in the band, high school band, for I suppose about a year before graduation. My twin brother Chester played alto sax. We formed a five-piece dance band. Our first dance job would have been in 1943 in the Arcade Ballroom in Fox Home, Minnesota, which is just west of Fergus Falls. And I can remember that uh, we made ten dollars a piece, which was quite fantastic at that time. for dances was an enjoyable uh, time the dance halls back in those days i had benches on on the sides the, the gals would be sitting on one side and, and the guys on the other side and i guess you'd eyeball back around and decide who you wanted to dance with and dancing was a major source of entertainment back in those days this is a picture of my wife and i her name was Ruth Bowe she was from Ashby Minnesota and uh, yeah she was sitting across the dance floor on the gal side of, and uh, that's how we met one saturday night i think it was we had a six piece dance job in morris at the armory the drum set was already set up when we arrived at the armory in the early evening but no, our drummer never showed so we called his house and his wife said well i guess he won't be coming he had too many beers at his buddies this afternoon so he's sound asleep so we played a couple of sets and i decided that we needed a drummer in rhythm more than we needed four horns up front so i went back on the drums and i started playing so i played a set or two and uh walt sarlet looked over at me and said I don't have to put up with this crap so he picked up his sax put it in the case and walked off the stage and went home so <laughs> Walt and I had many good laughs over that in later years and when I told his son Dell about it he said yeah that sounds like dad <laughs> so we had good times well, the jacket that I have on I was given when I was playing at the Mickey Carruth band out of Benson well, I've played with many bands over the years but this is the only time that we had a uniform like this so we kind of dolled it up a little bit I was asked to play taps at military funerals back in the uh, oh maybe early 90s Pat Lundberg who had been the regular tap player in town said it's time for me to hang it up he was probably 15 20 years older than I was so I took over in 1996 
and I've kept a record of all the taps that I've played for. I have played at 213 military funerals, mostly in the Madison area. I would guess that over half of these people are people that I knew or friends. And it gets to be a little difficult, but I'm really honored to do that. I guess I feel really blessed to have an appreciation for music. I often think of how empty a life must be for people that don't have any sense or appreciation for music. I've been playing music since 1942. So what is that, 70 years? From 1947 to 2001, when I hung it up for good, I have a record of 1,811 engagements. Uh, in addition to that, I played in the Madison Town Band, so maybe a couple hundred engagements with the Town Band. And then, of course, there's that 213 taps of military funerals. So now I'm up to 2,300, 2,400 times I've pulled my horn out of the case. So for an amateur, a poor sight reader, I guess I made real good use of my horn. Music has given me a full life, a good life. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota on the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 96.7cram.com.